to recap, this is, I think, going to be our conclusion of our restoration series, but we'll see. Um, so you never know when Ibrahim might give me a call or, or God. Uh, so we'll just, you know, hang on and see how that, how that works out. But part one of restoration, we were talking about being restored to calling and purpose. We talked about how it's a priority for God to restore. And we used the example of Peter. And when we looked at Peter, we saw that Peter, he had a calling on his life. Then he fell pretty significantly. But God, the first day Jesus came back on this planet, he came and he made a point to restore Peter as the rock in which the church would be built. So God is in the restoration business. He has interest in that. He prioritizes that. And then we went to, to uh, last week where we talked about if God's intention and his desire is for us to walk in a place of restoration, then we should do something ourselves as well. And so we talked about what we could do to retain that. And we talked about one of the key things of maintaining a place of restoration is to walk in a relationship with God. And one of the key things of walking in a relationship is called communication. And we said we needed to be in com communication with God continuously, inclusively, including all the things uh, in our lives, not just some sheltered things or just the tragic things or just even the praise things, but all things we should be in communication with him. And then we said, you know what? We can approach him confidently. We can have confidence that when we go to him, he will hear us. You know, the Bible tells him when we seek, we'll find, when we knock, he'll answer. You know, so we have a God who's responsive. We have a God who wants relationship. We have a God that wants to be in the relationship with communication. And so this is where I think uh, we need to conclude, and maybe we'll go further, I, I don't know, but where I think we need to go today is that if we're talking about relationship with God, if we're talking about communication, if we're talking about restoration, then one of the things that has to be significant and important and embedded in our hearts, in our minds, in, our, in what we do, is that we have to be ready to listen. <laughs> so sometimes we have in our minds, sometimes I have in my mind, this idea about what restoration might look like. And that if I don't get that thing happening, then I can get um, disappointed or whatever. But sometimes I don't quiet myself enough to say, God, you tell me the steps that I need to take. You order those, those steps in my life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through these four things today about listening. You know, you can think about this. Listening is kind of one of the lost arts of communication. So I don't know if anyone has uh, people like this in your lives. But sometimes, you know, when you're in dialogue and someone is just talking and talking and talking, or, you know, I have a good friend, Pastor uh, Jim uh, Price. Some of you probably saw him earlier today. Uh, Jim is one of the most humble servant leaders I've ever met in my life. But when he describes things, he describes them differently than I do when it comes to arguments or um, I might go as far as to say, if I'm in a fight, with someone like if I'm in a verbal battle, you know, I, I describe it maybe as an argument or a fight. Jim describes it as an intense time of fellowship. <laughs> when we find ourselves in a fight, an argument or an intense time of fellowship, many times the challenge that we face is that neither party is listening. All we're doing is, right, when someone's coming at you and they're describing their frustration with you, very rarely are we listening to the words they say. Instead, we are loading the chamber and getting ready to fire back, right? It's like we're preparing our rebuttal before we even hear what they're going to say because we're not going to lose this fight. We're going to win. And my win by making you look bad. <coughs> Well, unfortunately, sometimes we walk through life in that way with our God. Not that we're in a fight necessarily with God, but maybe when we don't understand what's happening in our lives. And maybe all we can do is go to God and appeal to him. And it says in the Bible we're supposed to bring our cares to him. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. We're supposed to do that. But I oftentimes wonder in my own life, do I take the time to say, you know what? I've expressed to you my issue. <laughs> my challenge. Now, God, you're my source. I'm going to be quiet so I can hear what your response is. I'm going to listen. 
to what you have to say. So today I want to navigate through four different attributes of listening, being present, seeking understanding, being reflective, and then maybe most importantly, <laughs> applying the instruction that you receive. So <clears throat> we listen to God, why? Why would we listen to him? I mean, it seems obvious, right? I mean, he's God and we're not, right? His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher, the word tells us. But why then do we struggle sometimes to think, or maybe we don't think, but, but maybe we uh, simply uh, behave in a way where it's like we act as if our thoughts are higher because we may not take time to pause to say, God, I'm here and listening. I'm ready to hear what you have to say. So we're going to walk through uh, these things. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the word of God. So I think what he's saying there is that, you know, we need to be tuned in to what God has to, to, to say to us. And I think he distinguishes that those ears that we put on when we're posturing ourselves to listen to God might look different than those ears we put on when we're listening to whatever the other voices are in our life. Like we can listen. There's all kinds of voices you want to speak into your life. The enemy has a voice. Your spouse has a voice. Your friends have a voice. Your enemies have a voice. And sometimes those voices that are against us can be louder or perceived to be louder than the voice that God has. So I think Bonhoeffer is saying here, you know what? Make sure you got your, your, your station tuned in to the right frequency. That I'm not a block out anything that is contradictory that doesn't line up with this word of God and I'm going to be in tune to what God has to say so I had received about a decade ago a prophetic word that I want to share with you about the importance to me that God was conveying to me of why I needed to listen this is God speaking to me by the way he gave this to me when I was flying to Japan I made a, a, a covenant with God. So when you go to Japan, you're, you're, at least my trips, are somewhere between 11 and 14 hours in an airplane. You run out of stuff to do real quick. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but I'm wider than most airplane seats. So it's like not comfortable. It's just kind of a pain to do. I love going there. I love to, to go and travel and all those things. But I, I told God, I said, you know, God, this is time when I know I can't be doing anything else other than sitting in this seat. That there is nothing that is happening other than I'm being transported to another country. And so I said, God, you know what? I'm going to buy some head headphones and I'm going to shut everything else down. And I'm going to just listen and believe that you're going to speak to me. And every time I've done that, he's spoken something significant in my life. And this is one of those things uh, for me. He said this, I want you to experience all of me. I want you to always feel my presence tangibly close to you. I always want you to be so close that you not only hear my voice, but you hear my whisper of the things I have to say that are only for you. I want the intimacy that closeness can only bring. I want you to be constantly near to me so that my touch is only a small motion from you. So the life of my breath can be felt on your face. Accept my love completely. When God is reaching for us for relationship, he doesn't want it to be some imaginary thing. He wants it to be a real, tangible thing where we're drawing close to him. And the Bible says, draw close to God and what? He will draw close to you. It's real. And when he's speaking this to me, it's because I wasn't like, there, this was a part, a small portion of a very, very large word he gave to me. And one of the things he was saying to me is that, you know what? I'm not rebuking you, but I want to love you in a way that you're not allowing me to do. Because you're not passionately seeking to be with me. You seek me, but it isn't with this intensity that I want. And he described to me the passion I had for my children and the fact that when they were apart from me, how my heart hurt. And he said, that same feeling is how I feel about you. Not that you've departed, not that you're a prodigal, 
but that you just aren't desperately looking to spend time with me. You're not staying so close to me that when you're navigating through life, hey, if you're going to go a little bit of a wrong way, I can, hey, write the course a little bit. Or you know what? Here, here you're about to encounter something. Hey, you know what? I need to tell you a secret. My grandkids demand our attention. And when they're sitting around us, especially when all 10 of them are together, each one of them will take an opportunity to come and sit on Mimi and Papa's lap. And so because there's so much going on, and frankly, it's chaotic, right? There's 10 traces running around all over the place. Yes. Help me, Lord Jesus. I love it. I love it, right? But it's like, it's like there's not enough of me to go around. And each one of them, at some point during the time of our visit, will come into our lap, grab our face, and push it to look right at her eyes and say something like, Papa, I love you. God is looking for us and saying, you know what? You may be existing in this chaotic place. Get close to me. Come into me where you're so close, I can touch you. Where you're so close, I can whisper to you. Where you're so close that you can feel the breath on your face. The life-giving breath of God. And so it's critical that we put ourselves in a place where we can hear, where we can listen. So I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Proverbs chapter 2. And verses 1 through 6. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, this is listening, and inclining your ear, your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. There's a lot of powerful words in that passage. And so what I want to use that for is to describe how God wants us to be present. So first of all, when we're talking about being present to listen, we need to know that we are to treasure the words that God has for us. We should be looking at them like they are so valuable that I want to be present to get those things, right? Does anybody else have the experience that like Christmas time when you were a kid was just over the top? Like it was like, oh man, I just knew it was going to just have so much joy, so much uh, wonder. And my parents did such a wonderful job of making it that way. But you know what? There would be nothing that is going to keep me lying in bed past six in the morning, even though we weren't allowed to wake them till seven. Because it was like, and actually I'd be up way before that. I'd go in and wake up my sister or she'd already be awake. And we'd sit in there until the time that we could go in. Right, what? Why were we doing that? Because we knew that there was treasure, right? There was gifts. There were things that, that were going to be given to us. And we placed value on that. Because we knew that it was an expression of our parents' love towards us. God is saying, you know what? I have words for you. I have treasure stored up in heaven that is just for you. To define your purpose, your calling, your next direction. To bring you help in your times of trouble. We need to value that. We need to treasure that. Secondly, we must get in a posture where we can pay attention. Separating us from anything else. So here's the thing. I have single point focus multitasking is not my gift that's a challenge when you're married to a, a, a billionaire multitasker <laughs> you know it's challenging because we see life differently and we process things differently so for example uh, anyone who's driven with me knows that almost always even if I'm driving home from here I'll have the GPS on for good reason we have some who could attest yesterday that it was a good reason. <laughs> Even with the GPS, we went on a journey that I wasn't anticipating. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I'm listening, right? I'm listening to the GPS. I have a passenger who doesn't care what the GPS says. Regardless if I change the, the voice to some, you know, stellar man voice or, or the annoying lady voice, it doesn't matter. She's going to talk over that GPS. And so our standard trip when we're driving, honey, when the GPS is talking, you're not. <laughs> I, I need to hear the direction. But sometimes in life, it's much more serious. We don't silence the things around us to allow God to be the only voice we hear. All the things are, don't stop right? Bombarding us and bombarding us. So for me, I've got to find a space that I can go to. It's described sometimes in the Bible as a prayer closet. For me, I know if I can get out in nature, if I can get outside, if I can just go in the woods and just like not see anybody, not hear anything, not have a cell phone signal, hallelujah, and say, you know what, God, I'm doing my best to silence the other voices that are trying to speak to me. And I'm prioritizing you because I treasure you and I know what you have for me is rich. I know what you have for me is life. I know what you have for me is important and I value it enough to separate myself off out from anything else. You know, and we all know how this works, right? When someone's talking to you and, and like you're speaking and then all of a sudden they're walking around and, and they're doing other things, you're like, okay, so how important is the time that we're talking about? Paul writes this. He says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, he's using that in a different context, but I want you to think about this. We can have a theological debate afterwards. But the reality is the voices of the world are constantly speaking to you. They're constantly talking to you, constantly telling you things. And sometimes whether you want to or not, you hear those voices. I'm saying that, you know what, we may need to be absent <laughs> And say, you know what? I'm clocking out of this for a bit of time, and I'm going to hear. Some of you already do this, right? Because I hear almost all of you at one point or another say, you know what? Not going to be on social media for a while, or I'm not even on it to begin with, or whatever. I'm just checking out. What are we doing? We're separating now because we don't want those voices constantly hitting us. So we must be present to the Lord and listen to what he has to say. And as we listen, he will give us exactly what we need to obtain a restored position and to retain that restored position. So we want to be present. So the next thing we're going to talk about next is seeking understanding. Have you ever heard of Stephen Covey? If you were old like me, there was a time when everybody had a Franklin planner. The Franklin Planner was a calendar that helps you structure your thoughts. Well, it was invented by this man, Stephen Covey. He wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He writes this, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Almost every management training that I've ever taken has included this piece. Seek understanding and then to be understood. What does that mean? Sometimes we are so busy to say, I want my voice to be heard. Sometimes we're so concerned about us being right that we devalue whatever the message is coming to us and we have no uh, regard for understanding or even trying to understand what the message may be coming from us. And maybe if that's with people, it might be rude, but we maybe can get by. But if that is the way we comprehend God and we're not, and all we want to do is go and get on our knees and be like, God, it's so bad. Help me. God, there's terrible. Get me out of the situation. God, I can't take any more. If that's our only relationship with God, and we're not seeking to understand his solution, we're not seeking to posture ourselves to hear, then we have an issue. Sometimes we need to just say, you know what? I'm going to dig in. So if you've ever had the study, like significantly study for some, any kind of a test, driver's test, college test, high school test, whatever. And it's like, okay, if I don't study, I do not have the wisdom to be able to pass whatever this test is. So what do you do? You study. 
if you do the right thing, as if you don't care, you say, man, whatever, I disagree. <laughs> but what I'm after is to say, you know, God convicted me one time and he said this, he said, I'm the type of person that if I'm in a class, I want the A. I'm gonna study, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna not sleep, because I'm gonna get the A. Well, sometimes that's a problem because you're more concerned about the A than learning and there's all kinds of whatever. Don't judge me. <laughs> but we're talking about seeking understanding. But the reality God told me is that, Jeff, you will sacrifice your physical needs to try to get an A. And all I'm asking is to say, what if you sought me with that same passion? What if you sought to understand? What if the, the, the instead of looking at Revelation and saying, whoa, <laughs> Don't know. What if you said, you know what? I don't have the strength to do it, but I'm going to seek understanding because you do. What if we position ourselves to hear the words of God that we may very well need for our lives, but we seek understanding? Part of listening is being present. Part of listening is saying, you know what? I'm going to be attentive to your words and I'm going to seek to understand them. Now, don't get mad at me. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs 18 and verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, <laughs> but only in expressing his opinion. Read it. It's really in there. I mean, this is the English Standard Version, so maybe the King James says it differently. But I'm just saying, the Proverbs is describing someone who doesn't seek to understand as foolish we don't want to walk through this life not listening and, and being foolish. If we desire to walk a walk of restoration, to continue to walk in a place where God is directing and guiding us, we must seek to understand this message. We first need to be present to hear it. But then when we hear it, how many of you have ever gotten a message from God and it's like, I don't know. What does that mean? God gave us a message when he was first calling us to move to Tennessee from Ohio, just being honest, I rejected that message because he gave it to Tracy and I'm like, well, if you give it to her, you can give it to me. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but this is why I rejected it. So I'm a fairly logic-based person, fairly analytical. I need to see this and this goes to here. God doesn't always work that way. God's got an order. He made me this way, so don't judge again. But the reality is this, is that here's what he told her, and this didn't compute in my mind. He gave her a vision of a cloud that looked like a piece of Swiss cheese and a blender and all these other symbolisms. And she's telling me this, and I'm like, did you eat Mexican? <laughs> did, I mean, did you, did you do, is there something in your body is rejecting and it's like, this is what's happening? Because I'm like looking in the Bible. I don't see any egg beater references. I don't, I, I'm like, God. And I'm trying to just have peace with my wife. And I'm, she's telling me this because it's about an hour long vision that she was given. And I'm listening and the whole time just going. God help her. God help her. Restore her mind. Turns out, God works in mysterious ways sometimes. He gives us things. What does he say? Some foolish things that will confound the lies. So I'm not saying my wife was foolish. But I am saying it was unusual. And it was hard to process. But the fool takes no pleasure in understanding. I'd encourage you, don't be a fool. <laughs> seek understanding as you seek to listen to God. The third element of listening is to be reflective. When I'm talking about reflecting, I'm saying that what we should take time to do is confirm that understanding. So it's one thing to mentally process it, but have you ever heard of the word active listening? So active listening is where you're not interrupting, but you're hearing someone talk and you're saying, you know what, when I hear you say that, I hear this, is that, is that right? It's, a, it's an advanced piece of the understanding component to be reflective. It's showing that you're engaged. It's showing that you're participating in the, in the dialogue. 
If we only reflect on our own thoughts, we're going to fall short. Reflection requires us to seek discernment from God. And what we're going to le learn right here is that when we reflect, we have to be very careful. The spirit of the living God lives within us if we have Jesus in our hearts. The Bible says, this is one of Brandon's favorites, that he's given us the mind of Christ, right? So how many of you know, I think we have this ability, however, in our carnality to be operating with that mind and to operate maybe neglecting that. And our carnal mind is constantly wanting to intercede, intervene, right? And give us maybe a different direction. And so I want to read this a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, excuse me, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. <coughs> When we're processing that which we listen to and listen from God, we need to be consulting with the Spirit. We need to make sure that we're weighing out those words that we hear with truth. Because we can, our processor can be fallible. We have to make sure, hey, this word that I got, this, this scripture and this revelation I received, as I was praying and listening, these, these words that are in my head, do those process correctly? And how do we do that? We do that by saying, you know what? I'm going to live a life yielded to the Spirit. The Spirit is going to lead and guide me, direct me, give me that discernment. We need to make sure that we don't fall into carnality and say, you know what? This is my interpretation and this is how it is without ever consulting with the Spirit. There's some times where you know, though, right? You have a word that is given from God and it's like, yes, your spirit resonates with it immediately. And then there are other times when you're like, ooh, I need to process a little bit. I'm encouraging you when you process, make sure the spirit is at the top of that engagement list. That we're going to him, we're looking to him, we're asking him for direction, guidance, and, and leadership. So that we know, that we know that those things that we hear are from God. The final thing that I want to talk about is applying the instruction, applying what we hear. A leader that is in, our, is in my company um, from Japan, um, he's a part of the family. Ours is a family-owned business, so he's like the fourth generation of the founders of our company. He came here, was sent to school, he's uh, in his 40s, I guess, and he was just appointed as the top chief executive officer of our company. I got the chance to spend months of time with him one-on-one, -on -one, and he imparted a lot of wisdom. One of the things, he said this, he said, Jeff, a plan without action is just a thought. Very deep. A plan without action is just a thought. So here's the thing. We all can hear God. God says this. He describes himself as a good shepherd, right? Jesus is a good shepherd. And it says, my sheep hear and know my voice. There's no exemptions to say, you that are a black sheep, you that are in the southern pasture, you don't get it. My sheep, if I've accepted him as my shepherd, I am one of his sheep and I can hear his voice. But here's the thing, if I hear his voice and it says, I say, yes, I heard that, that word now moves into action only when I take action on it, not when I just ponder it. Not when I just, the word is always going to drive you to do something. To take it and, and make something happen with it. Something that he's telling you, probably something beyond what you think you're capable of. The message that we receive through being present, seeking, understanding, reflecting, 
has very little impact if we don't apply it. But the application is through the power of God. This then becomes that walk of faith, right? It's like, I heard what you said. <laughs> I don't see what you're asking me. I heard what you said. I understand. I've sought you out. Well. I sought understanding. I consulted with the spirit. And now it's time to move. And usually in my life, that movement comes with the vision of I can see this. I can't see that. But what do I have to do? I have to move. I have to move towards that. I have to move in that, that place. I have to put it to action. The Bible says this, right? Faith without works is dead. We don't have a works gospel. Salvation is given freely, I would argue. It's free to us. It wasn't free to him. But the reality is this, is that we have to apply it. We have to do something with it. So let's look into James. This is one of my favorite books in the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James is calling us to action. Be a doer. You heard the word. You did all the right things. You set yourself apart. You were present with God. You sought understanding. You looked and said, spirit, guide, and lead me. You were reflective and said, is this what you mean? Yes, okay. Now let's do something with that. Application of what is heard is required for it not just to be a plan, but to be something that's going to be transformative. If we apply the instruction, chains will be broken. Yokes will be removed. Prison doors will open. Bondage that you might live in strongholds that the enemy has off by the power of Jesus, by the power of God Almighty, the power flowing through you through the Spirit. Amen. We'll walk as overcomers. We'll walk in a place of victory. We will be the head and not the tail. We'll be above and not beneath. We will be all that God said that we will be. We are called, just frankly, to be warriors. <laughs> You're going to be in battles. But you know what? It would be foolish, as the Bible says, not to listen to the commander in chief. Not to say, ready for service, I'm present. Here I am, send me. Right. That word comes to us and you say, you know what? I need to understand. It's Pray to the, in the spirit, Lord, give me revelation knowledge. And when that comes, is this what you're saying for me? Yes. And step out and take that, and take that, take that walk. Be empowered by God Almighty. Listening is so important. You've heard it said, you give two ears and one mouth for a reason. When we go before God, here's what I think our posture needs to be. Both the ears open both eyes open, this securely shut. And just say, those are the receivers. My eyes are the receiver. My ears are the receiver. This, it's, it, it's a deliverer, which there comes a time, but I need the impartation before I can deliver. I need something higher than me before I can deliver. I need to be filled before I can be poured out. Listening is how we do that. So I'm asking you, I'm asking me today, are you ready to listen? To be present and accounted for. Shutting down the voices that might distract you. Seeking and finding. Seeking is like this. I'm going to seek until I find. Not I'm going to seek and then I give up. Is seeking easy? <laughs> it isn't for me. Sometimes it comes with cost. Sometimes to seek this, I have to give up something here. And sometimes I don't want to do that. But if we can get fully dependent on God, loving him with our whole heart, mind, being, everything within us, every breath within us, praising him and seeking him, and then knowing with confidence, as I seek him, I will find him. And then when I find him, I will hear him. I am that sheep that will hear his voice. And when I hear it, I'm going to be saying, is this what you meant? And be willing to yield to the staff. 
to the shepherd hook. So if I drift, hey, get back. Instead of resisting, right? That and running in another direction, say, okay, I'm gonna come back into alignment, it's fine. And I'm gonna reflect back to him. This is what you've said to me and I'm gonna do it with everything within me. And I'm gonna be moved to action. I'm gonna apply what I heard. That's the way we become world changers. That's the way miracles flow through us. That's the way that we see things that are not possible in the natural. Hearing from God Almighty and processing that. So today, uh, I want Tracy, if you would come up, I, I want you to pray, not, not play. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who feels like they're at a place that says, you know what? I, I feel like this, like I'm not listening as well as I could. I think we all have that opportunity. So what I want is I want, um, I want Tracy to just say a prayer over us about empowering us to have our ears open. So this past week I had to go to the doctor and some of the silliness that's going on with my body is because of a severe ear infection. And I'm not smart enough to know I couldn't hear out of this ear, but as she was doing this exam in the office, it's like, you know, you, you like have hardly any hearing in your left ear. I was like, oh, interesting. But you know, when you can't hear, it causes problems, right? So if we're in our house and she's saying something to me and I don't hear it, she assumes I was paying attention and heard it. And there comes this impasse of things. But we all can have and need our ears to be opened in Jesus' name to be able to hear that still small voice. You all know the story that says, you know, I was out there and the earthquake and all these things happened and all of these big events but God wasn't there. And then there came a whisper. We need to position ourselves to say, you know, God, whether you're screaming out loud or whether you're whispering, I'm here. My ears are open. And I'm ready to I'm ready to receive. So I just want Tracy, maybe grab your mic again. Uh, I just want her to pray over us a prayer that our ears will be open, our eyes will be open. I shared with uh, some of you in the past several weeks a story of one of our daughters who was in a relationship and the enemy had blinded her. That she couldn't see that the relationship wasn't for her good. And any of the words that we gave to her were, were not able to be heard. She couldn't hear our words. She knew we loved her, but she couldn't accept the words we were telling her. And it was literally Satan had her blinded and had her ears shut off. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. It became an issue that it was uncomfortable to talk about. We had to back off to talk about it in front of her and had to just pray. And then one day, miraculously, off the blinders came. Off the plugs and the ears came off. And she heard, not from us, but she heard from God. And she said, oh my gosh, what if you were right? And it wasn't about us being right. It was about God coming down and saying, you know what, my child, you're being deceived. Eyes be opened, ears be opened. And she saw and she heard and she immediately moved to action. What I want for all of us is where the enemy has got us blinded where he's got us, where it's partially or totally deaf to what God is trying to say to us, that today he will open our eyes and open our ears. I just want Tracy to, to pray over, over us. Um, actually, if, if you're receptive to it, if not, just say, no, thank you. I think I would like you to go and anoint all of them and just pray over them. Um, is that okay? Are we okay? All right. Let me just play a prayer, corporate prayer, and then Tracy, um, if you would go do that. So, Lord, I just thank you, Lord God, that you are the God that opens eyes, 
that opens ears. And you have a word for every one of us. So Lord God, God I just submit us corporately to have our ears open, our eyes open to hear, to listen to what you have to say. And Lord, I ask that you give us the courage, Lord God, the stamina to do what you've asked us to do. Strengthen our faith. Strengthen our unbelief, Lord God. Help us to walk in your wisdom. And Lord, I thank you for it. And I praise you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again next week at 2 o'clock at Penny's Cafe.